So, first I would like to thank Jishanu. Um, so, a group of us got together in 2007 to work in this related area and started, a, started this meeting. And uh, it has grown from there. And now this is the fourth one in a row. So I specifically want to say this part, the, work, the entire meeting is for all of us. That includes all of you who are students here. We've taken an effort to get you all here. So please make sure somebody was telling me yesterday, oh, it's such a simple question. Don't hesitate to ask questions. If you have been coming to the meetings, provide. We know that we are not very strict on time. We get sessions done over because the whole idea of it is to have good discussion and good interaction between the student and faculty. It's an opportunity for all of us to learn. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Scott Brady. I'm going to start off with a personal anecdote. I interviewed with him in 1996 or 97, I don't remember, several years before I finished my PhD for a postdoctoral position. And I still remember with great fondness the squid threat that he showed me in Woodsford. When he squeezed out the squid anthropism, and it's, it's such a vivid memory that those papers that I had read from his lab, you could actually see a woman moving, it was totally amazing, cool. <laughs> So, it's it still, I mean, I still hold on to that thought. Uh, Scott is one of the persons who found Kaimisen and is a leader in the field. And it's a real pleasure to invite, you know, have him with us today and to give us a historical perspective on Exxon Transport. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you. <laughs> for reminding me, it's been a long time. And uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. This is my first trip to India. And uh, I will reiterate her comment about questions. If you have a question, don't hesitate to stop me and ask me. I'm more than happy to, uh, uh, to try to explain or answer anything that we can come up with. Um, and so, aside from the fact that I'm working three hours sleep, uh, so if I doze off, you'll know it's something you did. Um, okay, so today we're going to start off uh, with essentially an introduction from a historical perspective. And contrary to some people's uh, idea, I not, was not there at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> in fact, this is the man that was there at the beginning, and that's Sunny Abdul Kahal. But I always like to start off with this slide, which uh, was drawn by someone else who will be here later this week. Uh, Peter Hollenbeck, because it really makes vivid just how important axonal transport is to the nervous system. And this is a scale drawing of a human cervical motor neuron. So it's one about C5, C6, goes down the arm. And this little spider-like creature here is the cell body in the dendrites. This little swelling down here is where the terminal arbor is. And this line that goes back and forth, that's the axon. And what we have to keep in mind is that effectively all of the protein synthesis in, this, uh, in the neuron occurs there. You will see periodically reports of some protein synthesis in axons. But in terms of a percentage basis, even the most generous estimates uh, make this a fraction of a percent. And I'm not sure that in the mature axon there's actually any significant uh, protein synthesis in the axon. What that means then is that all of the proteins that you need throughout all of this expanse here and throughout all of the terminals has to be made in one spot here, and then it has to be packaged and delivered to wherever it's needed. And <coughs> that's not trivial because neurons are unusual cells in the fact that they are extraordinarily complex morphologically. So this is a nice little diagram here from an early edition of Campbell and Schwartz. And it makes the point that neurons have many different domains. And if you take an epithelial cell, you have maybe two major membranes: <coughs> the apical and the basolateral. So you have a protein that needs to go to the apical surface. 
It's pretty simple. You don't have a big logistical problem. Even if you do it totally by random, you have about a 50-50 chance of getting it to the right spot. Neurons may have tens of thousands of discrete functional microdomains, each of which has a distinctive protein composition in a particular place, and it has to respond to the environment. So you have, a, for instance, as the probably the simplest example of that is the node of Rambier where you have in a myelinated axon in each one of these nodes, you have a concentration of sodium channels that's extraordinarily selective, and these are potassium channels. How do you get the, make sure that you have the sodium channels here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here? Every single one of them, because if you miss one of the nodes of Rambier, that neuron doesn't work anymore. You don't have conduction with the action potential anymore if there are the appropriate number of sodium channels at those locations. This creates an enormous challenge, and it makes the point of just how critical this whole axonal transport business is for the function of the nervous system. And I think, as obviously I've spent a long time thinking about it and dealing with it, and over the course of this, this uh, school and this, uh, this workshop, uh, I think you'll get many examples of just how critical it is and why we need to think about it, both in terms of the normal function of the nervous system and in terms of disease. So I return to this slide, and as in so many of our ideas in, oh, thank you, in, uh, in neuroscience, we can trace back the first suggestions of axon transport to this gentleman here, Santiago Ramon y Caja. He essentially sitting in a small, laboratory with his razor blades and histological preparations, did a series of his studies on the nervous system in which he looked first to determine whether or not the nervous system was made up of cells. And he did. But he also was very interested in regeneration. And when he crushed a nerve, in this case a rabbit sanguine nerve, what he noticed is that he always saw that on the proximal side of that crush, he would get swellings. On the distal side of that crush, things would disappear. He reasoned from that that, number one, there had to be something coming from the cell bodies up here, and that that had to be moving in this direction in order to support the distal axons. And consistent with that, whenever he saw regeneration, it always started here and went that way. So this was the first suggestion, that there had to be some kind of flow or transport from the cell bodies to support the function of the terminals and it was actually one of the arguments that he used to demonstrate that the nervous system was made up of a collection of cells, not one large sensation. <clears throat> the field lay fallow for many years after that. Nobody knew what to think about it. Everybody was trying to do too many other things or follow up on too many other ideas that Cajal came up with. But in the late 40s, in response to a push to try to understand regeneration better because of injuries during World War II. Paul Weiss and Helen Hisco, and this is a picture of Paul, uh, essentially replicated the experiment of Cajal. They did a crush, and then they looked at the regeneration. And what they realized is that when they did this, uh, this transection in this case, that the axon had always grew from here. And he noticed, or they noticed, that the axons that grew out initially were very small, much smaller than the original axon. Even though the original axon was, you know, the, the proximal axon stuff was still large. But it went out, and it wasn't until it made contact that it started growing again. So I said, well, what happens if you put a little cuff around the nerve so that you can still let this small fiber go through, but you don't let it grow? And what they found was that there was this swelling again. This time, it wasn't a block because it wasn't transected. It was just an accumulation so that you couldn't get it through this constriction here. And then when they released the constriction, there was a, essentially a series of what they interpreted as pulsatile uh, elements moving down the axon at about two to three, four millimeters per day, which just happened to be the rate of regeneration in these fibers. And so they essentially created the term axoplasmic flow. And this was in the late 40s. And for a number of years after that, that was all that we knew about it. There was some slow outflowing of material 
And the initial idea is sort of had it as being sort of a general flow of materials, sort of like the stream in a, uh, a river. But in the late 60s, several people took different approaches to try to understand this better. And one in particular, Ray Lassick, was, uh, who was, happened to have been my postdoc mentor, uh, was actually a graduate student at this time. So this is a good lesson for graduate students. And he was reading the literature and he said, you know, two to four millimeters per day is too slow. There's got to be something faster. And so he sat down and he thought about how to approach it. And what he came up with is that he took a situation which he took radioactive amino acids, injected them into the spinal cord, and then looked at different times along the nerve. And when he did that, oops, he saw this wave of material out. But most importantly, he saw a wave that was going two orders of magnitude faster on the order of four, uh, 250 to 400 millimeters per day. Now, independent of that, this woman, Liliana Lubinska, had been doing crushes and looking at the change in activity of acetylcholinesterase. And what she saw is that there was an accumulation of acetylcholinesterase activity on the proximal side of a crush. And then she did a double crush, a double ligation in this case. She also saw stuff coming back. And she reasoned that there was indeed some kind of movement going on. And these rates were also much, much faster than you could in a top for it with the axoplasmic flow idea. So, yes? Did, uh, did Paul Weinstein and Hedden also see retrograde flow in there? Yeah. No. no, retrograde flow was not until really Liliana Lubinska who specifically showed that. Although there were hints earlier on because of the fact that we knew that viruses would invade the nervous system and things like that. And in fact, uh, Mr. Christensen uh, used the uptake of a fluorescent attack virus to really document anterograde, uh, retrograde transport uh, in, a, in a characteristic way, which I'll mention here in just a minute. So, so these two methods here, the accumulation of enzyme activity at a ligation and the movement of radioactive precursors started to provide evidence that there was something much faster. And then co uh, coordinate with that, Annika Dahlstrom up in Sweden was a histochemist and she took advantage of a treatment uh, of a, a curious fact of norepinephrine, which when you fix it with aldehydes will become fluorescent, intensely fluorescent. And she developed a quantitative method for measuring the accumulation of uh, norepinephrine containing vesicles. As a result, she also saw that there was this accumulation of material that was clearly appearing at a rate that was inconsistent with this flow, this slow flow. And so in the period of a couple of years, in the late 60s, three different groups really postulated the idea that there was indeed some kind of fast rate of transport. And this was fast enough so that even the longest axon, within a day or so, you would go from the, um, uh, uh, the commitment to transport to the terminus. And that was starting to be fast enough so that you could actually do something in a physiological response and be consistent with the kind of things that we saw in, um, in the response of the nervous system. Now, Ray went on to look at this in much greater detail, and he took advantage of the power of this radioisotopic labeling, and he was able to show that it was more than just a couple of different uh, rates. There was more than just a slow rate and a fast rate, but that in fact, he could also define multiple waves of material going down. So we've already talked to you about the fast rates coming down here, right here. So he saw this nice wave coming down. And this seemed to be going at the, uh, the, the 400 millimeters per day in a peripheral nerve. But there were also two subsequent ways that if he waited longer, he would be able to identify these, and they would be one that was moving about two to four millimeters per day, which was about the rate that Vice uh, and Pisco had reported. And there was another rate that was moving even slower, moving at less than a millimeter per day. He also used on radiography of gels electrophoresis and realized that the proteins that were moving at this rate 
were completely different from the proteins moving at this rate, suggesting that there was something distinct about these waves of material coming down that was characteristic of the physiology and the cell biology. And ultimately, one could define multiple components, and this is just sort of a, a standard one from uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> mid-70s. Using this pulse-chase kind of method, uh, the Lassen group, Mark Willard, various others, were able to show that indeed there was a number of different rates. There was a fast anterograde rate that was moving out from the cell body, and this seemed to be associated with membrane proteins. Membrane proteins, glycoproteins, the contents of synaptic vesicles, uh, such as norepinephrine, for example, or neuropeptides, would be going there. And uh, other kinds of things of that sort would be going down at this fastest rate. There was also a rate that could be clearly associated with the mitochondria. So that if you used mitochondrial markers, they would be moving down as well, and they would be moving predominantly in the anterograde direction. And they would also essentially be moving out somewhat slowly, about 50 to 100, about a quarter of the speed of the fastest rate. Christopher Christensen, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, working also in Stockholm in this case, he essentially was taking first some fluorescent dyes and some fluorescently tagged uh, viruses, and he would put them in the vicinity of the cell bodies, excuse me, of the cell terminals. And what he would then do is look at the appearance of this material in the cell bodies. And he reasoned from that that there was, in addition, this retrograde transport. And the retrograde transport, on average, for these kinds of assays, ends up going at about half the rate of the fastest retrograde. Now, there may be additional sort of uh, subgroupings within this, so that if you look in great detail at the kinetics of specific proteins, you can show slight differences in the, how they're moved in these fastest rates. But for our purposes right now, it's perfectly fine just to think of it as being, you have the movement of membrane-bound organelles here, membrane-bound organelles here, and membrane-bound organelles here. Now, as we'll see, that's partic uh, the retrograde uh, point is taking advantage or is uh, reflecting a unique aspect of neurons that is often not acknowledged. You essentially have no mature lysosomes in the axon. To get degradation of membrane proteins, you commit them to pre-lysosomal structures, which can be uh, vesicles, multivesicular bodies, multivalent bodies. They are taken back to the cell body, and there they fuse with primary lysosomes to become the fully functional organelle. So now we have not only the synthesis of membrane proteins segregated from the rest of the cell, but you have the degradation. So you have this centralization of function, which is very critical to understanding why the neurons in the nervous system work the way it is. Now, in each one of these cases, it's pretty clear cut. We've got a nice, distinct package that we can point to in electron micrographs, or we can fluorescently tag with some proteins and see them, and it's clearly a structure that's moving. But we also have a lot of other proteins that are present in the nervous and those other proteins include some that are clearly structural, like neurofilaments and microtubules, and some that are what you've been told are soluble proteins. Some of you may still see in textbooks a description of the cell soup and the idea that you have these proteins that are just sort of floating around randomly inside the cytoplasm. Those proteins will move down as a discrete wave from the cell body to the terminals a meter away in some cases. Does that sound like a soluble protein to you? Does that sound like a freely diffusing protein? The bell-shaped curve that you see in these pulse chase experiments is very different from anything you would predict from the uh, uh, a soluble diffusible protein. Now, that doesn't mean that they never act or exist in a soluble form, but it means that somehow their transport is being coordinated and essentially managed as some as yet to be identified complex. And Sabojit Roy, who will be talking here, has spent a lot of time looking at this question. We'll come back to that, obviously. 
The final one here is trying to identify the neurofilaments and microtubules and what things are actually moving there. And for many years in the field, there was a, a, a serious dispute about what was the form of moving atoms in the very slowest rate of stuff. And again, some of the people who are going to be presenting here uh, have looked at that in particular. But there's one story that I think is well worthwhile, and it sort of points out one of the powerful aspects of this, this model and being able to study uh, these properties of neuronal proteins in situ is that in the <coughs> early 70s, it was known from electron micrographs that you had all these neurofilamentous structures. They were the things that were staining in mass. Uh, silver stains uh, from classical histology, and there was clearly a huge amount of this protein there. We didn't know what the polypeptide composition was. So these proteins were not very soluble, so it was difficult to really identify them under those circumstances. And at that time, a number of people had identified uh, some of the family of proteins known as neurofilaments. And it was presumed, this because of morphological grounds, that the neurofilaments were a member of this family. And so people began trying to purify, and they did not succeed. There was one group that announced that they had purified it. They found about a 50 kD protein, and they insisted that it was neurofilaments because it came from you know, the nervous system. Now, despite the fact that the antibodies always didn't go yet. Well, about this time, Paul Hoffman and Ray Lassick did this pulse chase. And one of the things that they saw was that there were three bands, or actually there were five bands moving at the very slowest rate. Two of them were clearly identifiable as tubular. So they were about the 50 kD. They moved nicely, coherently. And then there were three higher molecular weight ones that were as abundant or more abundant in large axons. And when they looked at those, they said, well, what are these proteins? And they proposed that these were the neurofilament subunits, at which point they were roundly condemned as how can you use this kind of analysis to understand cell biology and biochemistry, you have to purify it, you have to do it, and they were just dismissed. Until a few years later when Bill Schleifer purified neurofilaments and found that there was a triplet of proteins that corresponded exactly with the proteins that had been identified by Hoffman and Lassen. Now, one of the things that's raised is, however, is that if neurofilaments are so insoluble, and if they are so difficult to do, how are these guys moving? If you look at their electron micrographs, everybody will tell you, hey, everything's cross-linked, right? Well, there's a funny thing about cross-linking. When you treat things with chemical fixatives, they get cross-linked. And those cross-links become stable. They are not necessarily stable in C2. And they are not necessarily stable in the living cell. And as a result, one of the questions that became an ongoing issue was, what was actually moving? And in the mid-70s, uh, Ray Lassie's group, and at the time I was uh, in the late 70s is when I, I joined it, uh, started developing an idea. And we proposed the idea that, in fact, that the things that were moving down the axon were cytologically distinct structures. So they were coherent structures that the cell created for transport but possibly for other purposes as well. So, for example, in the case of the cytoskeleton, the microtubules and neurofilaments, they were transported as microtubules and as neurofilaments, not as subunit proteins. And this led to decades-long controversy as to was it the microtubules, was it the neurofilaments, was it the, uh, the subunits? And there are still a few people who are committed to the idea that it's individual elements, but, as you'll see, as we go on today and in later talks, I think, during the course of the week, that it's clear at this point that microtubules and neurofilaments can and do move, and that those are the structures that are moving. So those structures are both for transport and, of course, with the microtubules in particular, they're the substrate for moving things along. So two functions there. In the case of the vesicles, Clearly, they're a nice compartment for various metabolic and physiological elements, whether it be energy production, such as the mitochondria, or neurotransmitter release, 
uh, or neuropeptide release, which would go up here with the tubular secondary structures, or just delivery of materials to the right places in the right amounts, like those sodium shells I showed you in those broad Sure. Sure. What is the need of having them uh, moved as, as microtubular electrons? Well, in principle, it doesn't have to be. But in practice, let's think about this. You've got things you need to move. You've got motor proteins, which is, of course, the topic of this session. Uh, how many motor proteins do you have? Any idea, say, what the concentration of kinesin is in nervous tissue? It's about 100 to 500 nanometer, nanometer. Okay, what's the concentration of tubin? Tubin dimers are about 25 micromore. Okay, now how are we going to move <laughs> the three quarters of magnitude more proteins as individual segments? It's a very inefficient way. Packaging it together, it becomes a very effective way of doing it. And you essentially are keeping everything as a functional unit under those circumstances. On the wings from body, you have been some support should be there on which the body will affect the body will move. My critical itself is moving, but kinesin on which I'm not on what you would have Okay. Well, uh, Peter Bass will talk a lot about that a little bit later, but it's a very good question. And the exact motors that are responsible for the moving of the microtubules and their filaments has been an ongoing series of questions. At this point, it appears that at least in the case of the neurofilaments, it's very likely to be the cytoplasmic dynein. In the case of microtubules, it's probably uh, some kinesin family members, although it may also be cytoplasmic dynein in some cases as well. And what you have to have under those circumstances is that you have to have a stable interaction with, say, the microtubule if it's a cargo. And then you have to have the motor one, which is actually the translocation step. So it's like a bootstrapping kind of thing. You move one versus the other. Now, one thing that I've always thought was noteworthy is that if you look at a neuron, well, let's step back. If you have what's the, a different kind of cell projection, a cilia, if you take a ciliated organism and you shear off the cilia, it will easily make new ones in the project. And they'll do that perfectly well in solution you know, just as they're a non adhere culture or anything like that sort. If you take a neuron and you shear off its, its axon and you keep it from blind, uh, sitting on a substrate, it will never put out anything. It requires an interaction with the substrate. And that suggests, to me at least, that it's a combination of the uh, membrane cytoskeleton and the cytoskeletal elements taking turns, as it were, to move things. And one of the things that's distinctive about these kinds of movements, the microtubule movements and the neurofilament movements, is that they're very discontinuous. So they move for a little while, and then they stay for a while. Move for a little while, and stay for a little while. In contrast, these materials up here, they're moving essentially all the time. If you see real-time videos of vesicles moving, it's not stopping and starting. It's moving continuously. So, that's one of the keys here, why you can have, for instance, proteins that are down here, uh, say a kinesin-based uh, movement for uh, the microtubules, and a kinesin-based movement for the vesicles, they're moving at two orders of magnitude at different rates. Because this only moves 1% of the time, and this moves 100% of the time. Does that make sense? Yeah? Is there any overlap between the partial movement and the kinesin movement? Well, it's... Something starts and changes space. Sure. Well, that goes back to the regulation of transport and how do you regulate the delivery of these things. So, for example, in the case of the cytoskeleton, it appears that it moves until it gets to the end and then it's degraded. The things moving in retrograde transport are membrane associated proteins or things that are taken up uh, through the end of uh, life, uh, the end of some system. They, these guys don't come back. These guys, some of them go down, some of them come back, some of them are degraded locally or are secreted as the case may be. 
And then it's really important, particularly here, that they go to the right places in the right uh, amounts. So you want to have synaptic vesicles going down to the presynaptic terminals, say, but you want to have the sodium channels to stop at the nodes of Rampier, for example. That's one of the really big questions that we're still grappling with. How does the neuron do that? How does it target specific things to specific places? How does it control the amount of movement and when you start degrading the microtubes in their films? Using uh, pulse chase experiments, you can show that there's very little turnover of neurofilaments and microtubules in the axon along the way. And yet, once they go down to the terminals, they disappear very rapidly. How do you coordinate that? And the fact is, is that we don't fully understand the signals and how that's managed with those circumstances. But we can show that it doesn't need to occur. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, <clears throat> So, what this led to then is what was called the structural hypothesis of, of uh, axonal transport. And for a long time, I think there were a lot of people who were confused because it was just a hypothesis. And it worked. But, uh, but in fact, it really was just a description of how we could see these movements, how we could accomplish these movements, and how we would be able to uh, orchestrate the whole set of movements that are needed to be able to generate a nervous system and then to maintain it. And that's really the critical questions that we're interested in. How do you generate a neuron? How do you maintain it? With all its complexity, all of its thousands of different, uh, different uh, uh, connections, uh, one of the things that we all do is that we always draw neurons with a single synapse at the end. I don't think I, there is a, such a, a neuron. I don't think there's any neuron in the world that has only a single presynaptic terminal. And in fact, you may have a thousand presynaptic terminals. And you may be strengthening one quarter of them, maintaining half of them, and weakening another quarter of them, all in the same neuron at the same time. That's a pretty neat trick. How do you do that? And I think we're starting to understand some of the methods and some of the approaches that the cell uses to do that, but it's very far from well understood right now. So, what we can say now is that it appears that there are a set of fast organ product transport in which you have essentially the movement of membrane down the brain mouse. There are sort of two main pathways into that. You can have the synthesis of mitochondria, assembly of mitochondria, and maybe commitment. The creation of the organelle is distinct from its commitment to transport, and the movement of mitochondria is in some ways very different from the movement of these uh, small vesicular structures. The small vesicular structures appear to be all close Golgi. So you end up having synthesis on rough ER, putting it in through the Golgi processing, and assembling discrete sets of vesicles that have particular complements of proteins. Now, one of the things that we have to appreciate is that if you're going to be able to assemble this axon and this presynaptic terminal and all the different subdomains that are in there, you're going to have some things that need to go down here, some things that need to go here. So how do you distinguish them and how do you tell, as it's going along, which place to go? And you have to remember, these vesicles, these small vesicles, are on the order of 50 to 100 nanometers in diameter. And they're moving along these microtubules. And we'll show you some images of the microtubule stuff in just a minute. In fact, I'll uh, show you. Oops, excuse me. This is a nice little set of device in here. Now, one thing that will come out, I think, over the course of the next little while is that it's really critical how you're imaging this up here. Now, these fluorescent images here, this is actually time lapse. And that can actually give you, this is relatively fast. Uh, acquisition, but you can get very different images and impressions about what the nature of the movement is, depending upon whether you're collecting it at, say, two or three frames per second or 30 frames per second. If you've got a 50 nanometer structure moving at two to four microns per second, and you're uh, looking at it every half a second or every quarter of a second, 
you are going to have that smeared all over the place and you're not going to see that best. So a very large part of what's been published in terms of visualization of fluorescent particles is looking at a very aberrant set of vesicles. Large, non-physiological vesicles, which are probably part of the degradation system and the response to overexpression. And they're behaving with the stop and start back and forth. And instead, if you're looking at the actual movements, it's moving very fast and very quickly. And we know that because if we look at it with DIC, where we're not dependent upon labeling and we can have very fast acquisition times, we can see just how much movement there is. And in contrast here, you can see how this, this is also sped up because it's that, yes? So do you mean that if you actually have faster spin rate, you can actually catch these movements? You can actually see them, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, actually, I don't have it unfortunately with me, but we're in the process of putting together a series of videos. We're just looking at the same axon at different frame rates to see how it changes the appearance of the movements as you go along there. And I think that's something that needs to be done right now because I think it's a problem that's, that's plaguing the field because people are making a lot of interpretations. You'll see a lot of tug of war things. And I think most of that tug of war is an artifact because I don't think, by and large, in fact, we never see a tug of war in the DIC images that I'll show you just a few minutes. So. Huh? Oh, you can show tug of war in vitro in various ways. And you can show it in certain cell types, such as a, a non-neuronal uh, cell, where you have things that are essentially not going from point A to point B. They are essentially being moved around in that. So that's a different issue, but yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. So, yes? Do you think of these as local mechanisms and transport is just like a generalist which does delivery, or do you think that transport itself responds to these kinds of cues? I think transport itself responds to local cues. So it's a little bit of a hybrid to the two alternatives. Um, I think Peter has done some uh, has done some very nice things showing that uh, he you, when you have a branched axon, sometimes it'll be going down one, and that one will be growing, and the other one will be stationary. And then that will stop, and then the other one will start growing, and it'll have to start going down. So there are switches back and forth. Again, we don't understand how that's accomplished at the southern level. How does it know? Well, you go down and turn right, go down and turn left. Uh, which, how does the cell do that? I think it has to have something to do with local events Maybe at the branch point, or or some retrograde signal coming back, uh, there has to be something along that line, because you just can't. There's no way that the cell body can be telling this set of maps up, uh, this set of terminals to strengthen, this set of terminals to weaken. Uh, so there's just no mechanism that I know that will allow that. Uh, is there any mechanism of getting at the exam place, the going and the synchronous activity? I'm not trying to. Is there any mechanism or mechanism of getting at the axon base to regulate what goes in the axon and what? Well, there clearly is because we can see the consequences of it. But the question, the problem is, do we know what the mechanism is? And we have some hints about that, but not all. So, for example, there's now some nice work, and I don't know if it will be covered in this, this, uh, this session or not, uh, showing how you activate uh, signaling endosomes. And so, and we've actually done some stuff that we've published some of it, but not published some of it, uh, which shows how you can activate retrograde transport of membrane bounded organelles. So, if you do it pathologically, such as we did with the, uh, 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 the neurotoxin MP, MPP, uh, you can essentially clear out the presynaptic terminal of, uh, of the secular structures uh, just by activating the retrograde transport. So, I can talk about that later in one of our later. I have one more question. Yes. Uh -huh. you, you made the point um, which I like very much because mm -hmm. we see the same thing in our system that the majority of the organelles that move the axon move unidirectionally mm -hmm. in either the anterograde or retrograde direction. Um, is that 
is that only the fastest component, or do mitochondria have all the other components also do that? So, a very good question. For the microtubules and neurofilaments, by and large, they seem to be pretty much unidirectional. Okay, cytostyle filaments seem to be pretty much unidirectional. And that's true for the soluble proteins, too. I think so much you're probably confirmed. In the case of mitochondria, now they're a very, very interesting subset of organelles because they go by different rules than anything else. And that's actually one of the hazards. You can't generalize from mitochondrial behavior to what other things are doing at the same time. Um, if you look at any cell type, mitochondria congregate in areas where there's high ATP utilization. How do they know that? We don't know <laughs> the answer is that. But it's clear in the neuron as well, is that they will go down and they will move up to a point, and when they find a location where there's high ATP utilization, they'll stop. And most mitochondria in the neuron are not moving at any given time. It's only a small subset. It is clear, however, that the ones that are going net anterograde, let's see here, I think I have, there we go. <clears throat> this is a, a nice paper, I think we're going to talk about this a little later, uh, from Tsukita Nishikawa, and a very similar kind of image that was generated by Dick Smith about the same time. And this is the accumulation of vesicles on the uh, proximal side of a cold block. So there's no, the nice thing about this paper is that there's no disruption. You can just cool everything down focally in the neuron. This happens to be a saphenous and not a saphenous nerve, which is a very small nerve in the sort of the ankle. Um, and you cool it down and allow things to accumulate. So this is the region, not where it was cooled, but just adjacent to that. And what you see is on the proximal side, you see this enormous accumulation of very uniform looking small uh, tubular vesicular structures with occasional mitochondria. And the mitochondria, when you see them, all have nice, crispy, well-organized matrix. They're clearly very healthy mitochondria. Now, if you look over here on the distal side of that same nerve, not the same axon, but the same nerve. Oh, and don't be misled about the shape here. This just happens to be at a uh, straight line of class. So you're, uh, you're, you're just, this is a, 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 a characteristic of the, the fixation because of this, these cytoplasmic conclusions here. But now look at the mitochondria that you see here. The dense, Christy are dense, collapsed. These are clearly sick mitochondria. So in terms of the net flux, there's definitely stuff going out that's healthy and coming back to the sun. So again, locally, you will see some jockeying around in the case of the mitochondria. And they will move short distances in one direction or the other. But if you again will look integrated over time, you know, you will see one population that's moving one way and another one population is moving another way. So the cell is making the distinctions. Okay, yes? So this aggregate and retrograde transport, it is occurring simultaneously inside the cell. Oh, yeah. So our one might be to if both transports are going on, how is there any chance that they are interfering with each other? Um, well, it's quite reasonable to suggest that, given the fact that my uh, dynein and kinesin bind have an overlapping binding site on the microtubule. So you can, in fact, compete one with the other if you, if you choose to. Um, however, our view of our scale is really sort of misleading to us. So we think of this very big uh, <coughs> vesicle moving along this little tiny microtubule. Well, number one, a single kinesin moves along a single protofilament. So, and it's sticking out 35 nanometers from the surface of the microtubule before it interacts with the vesicle. All right, so you can get a number of different vesicles along the way there. It's also clear that dynein, although it also moves along a single protofilament, is more prone to moving back and forth across the uh, protofilaments. And so, what I can tell you is that if you look at individual microtubules with bidirectional transport, you will see things coming through and it looks like they're going to collide and they just spread through. And that's because there's much more space there than you realize. We're not seeing a true picture, and I can talk about that a little bit later on when we talk about the, the, the IC. 
and the limits of the microscope. Yes, Bill. Scott, um, in a normal non ligated uh, axon, do you see uh, different morphologies of the mitochondria? Because, you know, roughly half of the moving one should be one retrograde. Right? Yeah. So, uh, the question is uh, I guess getting at the possibility that the retrograde mitochondria aren't sick until you stop them and then they get sick. Mm. No, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think if you actually do, um, and these are tricky experiments, and we really should have Peter here uh, to so sort of be Peter Holland back. So have the three of us have this conversation because I think it's a sure worthwhile. It's well. Yes, um, but uh, I think that it doesn't seem to look that way because again, if you follow the mitochondria in say the axoplasm, the squid axoplasm. Uh, you see that they look like little worms sort of crawling along. You don't see back and forth. You don't see them, you know, uh, uh, going, you know, they, t they tend to persist in one direction and then stop. And very, every once in a while you see a, 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 an excursion back the other way, but we don't usually follow them for so long. And because they're so different in how they respond, we don't, we don't systematically measure those. But it's, it's clear that there's a lot of things that go on. And when you start doing things like changing the organization of the cytoskeleton, you can start changing the, the properties of that mitochondrial transport. So, for instance, when we take the isolated axoplasm, and I'll explain what all that means. <laughs> the isolated axoplasm being disrupted a little bit, you'll now see the mitochondria being pulled in different directions, and you'll actually see uh, it's as if the motor is attached to the surface and it stretches it out. And you can sometimes see a, an elastic recoil. And you're much more likely to see that with mitochondria than anything else. And that also, again, if you're doing time lapse, you will miss all those intermediate steps. You'll just see it here and then you'll see it here. So, so that's, that's the kind of thing that's going on. But it looks to me as if, as I would say, that the, the mitochondria have made a commitment one way or the other. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We've tried to do that, <laughs> and we got some suggested results, but it's it's harder to do than it sounds like. Um, and the question is really whether or not. I mean, um, yeah, it's it's just it's very difficult to do that in practice. It's a it's a great experiment if you can figure out how to do it. Uh, <laughs> well, there may be some cytoplasmic factors that are part of. Oh, very, very possible. Okay. Although, again, based on what I've said already, the idea of soluble cytoplasmic factors, I, I prefer the idea that things can exchange. I mean, things that aren't stuck in my pet. Yeah. Might be more stuck yeah. Things. Yeah, no, I think, I think there's that. And actually, my, my pet theory, and I, I really have no support for it other than uh, just sort of indirect, is the idea that, uh, that the mitochondria preferentially, preferentially uses its own ATP to move. And that if you have it taken away more quickly than it can, you know, adapt it for moving, then it'll stop. You make me a car like that. <laughs> That's an idea. I haven't thought about that, but no, I'm not into car making. So. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Going back to the slow and fast component, are there any cars which are working very fast, but then stall completely for some considerable time? So, in which category does that? Okay, so usually when we're talking about fast movement, it's just when they're moving, all right? And it's usually a membrane bounded organelle in that regard. Now, are some components targeted? And the answer is yes. Now, again, go back to the idea of how we draw the neuron and how it actually is. If you look in a uh, central nervous system, most synapses are not at the ends of, uh, of axons. Most of them are on Hassan. <coughs> So you will have synaptic vesicles or, or precursors coming along, and a certain percentage of them will have to be deposited in that on uh presynaptic ter terminal. And so, and that's just a little swelling on the side of the axon. So yes, things can be targeted in that way and be delivered. And the same thing with, say, the sodium channels or the potassium channels that are in the nose of the So those do come down and they get deposited then. And it's when we're talking about the transport, we're talking about when it's actually 
in transit. Okay, so, but when it goes to its location, then it's targeted wherever it's gone. Okay. Okay. In the case of mitochondria, that's what you see. They'll start and they're stopping. There we go. It's also true that in some cases, when you have a very sparse microtubule cytoskeleton, they'll run out of a microtubule and they'll fall off and they'll take a few seconds to get on it. So that will still be fast. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So just a follow up on mitochondria transport. Mm -hmm. So uh, mitochondria transport, so mitochondria respond to high ADP regions, so they, they generally move towards a high ADP region. ATP using regions. No, ADP. Uh, so oh, ADP. ADP. Yeah, that's a possibility, sure. And uh, mitochondrial movement is also controlled by the calcium concentration. So high calcium concentration generally store mitochondria. So. Okay. In vivo, that's not very typical. The calcium is not a major regulator of transport. I can show unchanged transport at 100 uh, micromolar calcium and at 1 picomolar calcium. Okay? No difference in the transport kinetics under those circumstances. Yeah. Calcium regulates and, and calcium that cause. Calcium regulates everything. But the problem is, is that the levels of calcium that are involved in most of those cases are very non-physiological. And you can also have, you have to remember that calcium has, is a major switching uh, component. It's a second messenger. And so the resting calcium levels inside the neuron are very low. They're at the nanomolar level. Uh, no, so I read some paper by Tom Schwartz. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he actually did a study you can get all kinds of, what happens when you increase the calcium concentration with mitochondria is that the mitochondria, in a relatively non, it's not a major calcium buffer compared to most, uh, the, in most cells. It will uncouple oxidative phosphorylation and take up the calcium. It's a pathological effect. It's a backup to clear the calcium and keep the calcium levels low. It's not a way of regulating the mitochondria transport. So there's no question that if you increase the calcium under those circumstances, uh, you know, at a high level and get a pathological, the mitochondria will stop. But these are sick mitochondria. They're not producing ATP if they're bringing in uh, calcium. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. The whole Miro Milton one is probably one that we should talk about later because the, there's a lot of, let's put it this way, you will read a lot of papers which will say dogma, Miro Milton, this, this. There's, if you also look at the rest of the literature, you find that there's a lot of stuff that doesn't add up. So uh, that story is not nearly as complete as it sounds like. Okay. And again, with the whole issue about calcium binding domains and things of that sort, you have to think about what are the concentrations of calcium. Okay. Most of these things are done in vitro at non-physiological levels. If you're starting to talk about micromolar and higher calcium, Number one, you'll activate calcium. They're proteases. And you'll start chewing up all kinds of things. Clearly that doesn't happen under normal circumstances except in very discrete compartments. So we have to be cautious in interpreting these because there's a lot of broad statements that have been made. And everybody's prone to a beat side one time or another. But there are a lot of broad statements to be made, like this one I'm just making, that if you make these big generalizations and, you know, if you start looking at the details, it's more nuanced than that. And certainly, I think the Miro Milton one, uh, there are things that just don't quite add up to that for my purposes. Now, it's clearly an important thing, but for instance, the Drosophila data and the mouse data give you opposite results. Okay, which one's right? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> so, but yeah, I think that's one of the kinds of things that we should discuss 
during this this course. Yes. No, the, that's a good question. The motor proteins, by and large, seem to have a certain intrinsic rate. So, a given the kinesins, basically most kinesins move at about the same rate. Now, there are some exceptions. So, there's some resins that seem to be force generating, uh, you know, trying to be there for tension rather than for translocation. There are others that go to the ends of microtubules and sit there under those circumstances. Uh, but the sort of maximal rate that you can get out of one of these motor proteins doesn't vary hugely. So the dynein, the kinesin, it's pretty close to the same, certainly in the ballpark. The rates at which things move uh, can be the result of particular motor proteins or, as in the case of the microtubules and the neurofilaments, the number of, the amount, the percentage of time that it spends actually moving. So there's instantaneous velocity and then there's you know, the integrated velocity. Uh -huh. That's a little quiet. And uh, how, how the motor interacts. Okay. Uh, for kinesin 1 and vesicles, uh, there's been a lot of talk about soluble forms and things of that sort. And that's based basically on uh, in vitro work. When we uh, did pulse chase experiments such as you saw with the, the, the radioactive labeling. We saw essentially no kinesin that didn't move at the fast rates. And if we started playing around with our extraction conditions and inhibit enzymes, kinases in particular, during the extraction, we get 95 to 99 percent of the kinesin on vesicles. So I don't believe there's a significant free soluble pool of kinesin 1. Now, some other kinesins there may be, because there certainly are other situations and other things. But for kinesin 1, it doesn't seem to have any significant amount of, like I said, free in solution. Um, <clears throat> it's also true that the kinesin that's on the vesicles, if you inhibit kinases and things of that sort, is very hard to get off. You can use very high salt, and it just doesn't come off enough to remove most peripheral membrane proteins. So there's a very tight association there. And it makes some sense because you wouldn't want to, if you're trying to move a vesicle a meter down from the middle of your back down to your toes, you don't want it to fall off every, <laughs> every couple of uh, microns. So uh, you definitely don't want to be exchanging under those circumstances. OK? So yes? Um, it, we just don't know that well enough. Uh, part of the problem is is that most of the work that's been done on that has been done on embryonic cultures, and uh, the embryo the embryonic neurons they're much more dynamic and they have a lot of a lot of things that are a little different. So uh, we just don't know. I guess is the short answer to that. Yeah. Are there any regulatory things known which bind to the motor and affect their translocation? Uh, there's certainly publications reporting it. <laughs> Uh, how many of them, you know, are physiological or not is not so clear cut. It's, it, there's one of the things that's been an ongoing problem, and we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but that's, that's okay, uh, is that <coughs> although people have made proposals about receptors for kinesin, uh, there's really no good data out there for a core receptor for kinesin. And so uh, there are certainly motor proteins which can interact with other proteins which can uh, produce it. So, for example, I think dynein is a good example in that regard. The dynein dynactin interaction is clearly an important important for a subset of dynein functions. And so that's a clear example where you do have that. And with kinesins, well, you've got 45 different kinesins. And my guess is, is that you've got a, <laughs> a wide range of different possibilities within that 45. Okay? Yes? Is there 